next speaker is is Joe Sussman from the Department of Structural Biology at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Robot in Israel. He is a biophysician by training, and he became a structural biologist quite early with a long-lasting love, I would say. Sorry. <laughs> with a long lasting love story, which has a good cholinesterol, because I think that you have studied more the sensors than anybody else in the world. Also, is interested in intrinsically unstructured protein and how to do protein adapt to extreme environments. Well, also, what's very, I mean, uh, relevant to Joel's career is that he was head of PDB from '94 to '99. As bio, bio links, uh, sorry, geographical links, I've put quite a number of places where he has worked, starting from Ithaca, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University, Jerusalem, Durham, Berkeley, Bethesda, Philadelphia, Pistakawe, Upton. That's where uh, the PDB Brookhaven labs were, and Rehovot. And when he was, in fact, in Brookhaven, he was a frequent flyer back and forth at Rehovot. So it was basically two places at the same time, if I'm not wrong. Now, as biological links, I put Ron Unger, Chaim Kreluski, Israel Silman, Jackie Beckman, Michel Arel, Otto Ritter, Enrique Abola, and Tom Blunden, all of those people with whom Joel has worked quite a lot during those years, starting with uh, Tom Blunden uh, early on in his career. Now, I think the first time I met uh, Joel was at uh, Rehovot in, uh, I think it was 93 or 94, and I was there to, to make a talk on Swiss Prot, and I presented, it was the early six or seven months after Expasi had gone on, so I presented the web, in fact, not only Expasi, but the web at the Weizmann Institute. And remember immediately the excitement of people at the Weizmann Institute, which immediately decided that they should go on and jump abroad. They created a mural site, a partial mural site of uh, Expasi at the time. They put all of that stuff on the web. Joel was very instrumental with Marvin Edelman and Leon Westerman in starting a lot of efforts, I mean, around the web at that time. So it was really an exciting time, and it uh, remembers that fondly. And it led two years later that uh, Joel decided that while he was organizing the 25 year anniversary of PDB, I mean, he asked me if I was willing to, that it would also be the 10th anniversary of Swiss Prod. And I'm really immensely grateful to him because there was no way I could have organized this, you know, 10 year anniversary meeting for Swiss Prod. It was, uh, we didn't have the uh, infrastructure, the knowledge how to do this and so on. And he always says that I was a co organizer. I mean, that's completely. Untrue, you know, he put my name on, he did everything. He allowed me to invite people and so on, but he was really doing all of the work, he and all of his people, Enrique Abola and others. So he was a all organizer of the meeting. So thank you, Joel. And it's been a pleasure to work with you for all these years. Thank you, Amos. Can you, is this on? Can you hear me? No? Soon it will be on. It's on now, okay? All right. So, uh, Amos, thank you very much. Uh, this meeting was uh, also for me a, a really exciting meeting, and you were co, co organizing despite what you said. Um, so just to give you a little background on this, where we were 10 years ago, this is Amos uh, at, at the meeting in Jerusalem. I think it really uh, characterizes him well. And, uh, and uh, uh, I don't know if he was describing the plight of the, of the Swiss Prot or the success of the Swiss Prot at the time. And the meeting was also um, organized with Manuel and Enrique as well. We actually met, I think, in Davos at the protein science meeting sitting and planning the meeting. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is just very, very briefly a few slides on some of the key issues and questions that were present in 1996, back at that time in Jerusalem. Then some issues today, which began then and are still present, and they were brought up by several speakers already. 
about getting the data into the databases, whether they should be pulled or pushed. And But I would say most of the talk will be on intrinsically disordered proteins, which we've been specializing in, and then one or two slides on a crystal ball of where we may be, or Amos may be in 2016. So these are just a few of the people who um, spoke at the meeting in uh, Jerusalem and the titles of their talks. And if you look down down the titles over here, um, no point. Um, it's for me very interesting how similar some of the topics are and how they've continued. If you look um, um, at, at Ralph's talk and um, um, Amos's talk, um, Chris's talk, I remember very well, mapping the protein universe and so on. Um, Ada gave a talk on phasing the ribosome and so on. This is um, over there, Janet, at the meeting. Um, Swiss model was presented at the meeting for the first time that I had heard about it. I thought it was just fascinating. Um, we presented uh, one of the first web browsers, and I put the references down because, in fact, early on, we contacted SwissProt and tried to make links back just when the web was beginning to become useful between the, between the PDB uh, entries and the Swiss Pro entries, and most importantly, to cross-check the sequences which are still being done. Um, this time when Amos came to visit Rehovot, I'll never forget, he showed me Manuel Pech's 3D Swiss images. These are curated images, of course, made by a computer, but by a human being driving the computer. This is one of the, the structures we solved, an early structure of one of the drugs for treating Alzheimer's, the molecule in red right in the middle of the active site. But I think it's an example of where a curated image beats just an automatically generated image. And so this was a virtual paper. We had never met um, um, uh, some of the authors on it, and it was published uh, together with the Swiss Pro people linking the two. That's a picture of uh, John Malt. He reported in 1994 the first, in 1996, the first results of CASP-1. They're up now to uh, CASP-7. At that time, it seemed like a very far out idea, and now it's a crucial part of uh, structural bioinformatics to try to assess the quality of structure predictions. Um, in the meeting in 96, we presented um, the first example that we had set up for pushing the data into the PDB. And I give this as a kind of paradigm of possibilities for other databases. When I went to Brookhaven, one of the first things I talked with the management, I said it was just insane that the authors would correspond with the curators. The curators would have to do virtually all of the work. Couldn't we work out some tool whereby we could have a, as best controlled vocabulary and as best controlled fields that the authors could fill in much of the information, or more importantly, computer programs that were producing the data would directly fill in the items into the, into the files. And uh, this resulted in a, this uh, auto debt, which was released in October 1996 after a, a lot of work. And uh, before that, the only real communication had been by email between the authors and the curators, within six months, 80% of the deposits were done by auto debt. It didn't take away from the curators, but it gave the curators a different level of curation because at that stage they could begin to look at possibly what the authors had done wrong than rather than just typing in all the, the trivial information. Most importantly, a lot of the information that hadn't been put in previously was captured this way because of contact with authors of various programs who wrote direct input into Autodep. So this was a computer-to-computer -computer interface, and it, it had a, a, an enormous impact. So much so that I took, I had that time more nerve than now, there was a long tradition of some of the most important journals, such as Nature, Science, and PIS, that did not require depositing of coordinates or the actual raw data into the PDB at that time. This was especially true of Nature, where, um, in fact, the previous editor, John Maddox, felt that an article in Nature was like a news story, and therefore it doesn't have to really be a scientific publication, nor have all the data 
So I wrote to Philip Campbell and made an appointment with him. In the course of an hour over coffee, while I was in his office, he called Floyd Bloom at Science. And this was in 1998, and there was a 180 degree change. Both journals published back to back editorials saying they had changed their policy and would not accept a paper unless the coordinates were deposited in the PDB. At the same time, Nick Casarelli followed in PNAS. And so at this stage, virtually all of the other journals followed. Of course, there were other journals such as Nucleic Acid Research that had done this well before, but these were important journals to get on board. And it just took, when they saw that it was not that difficult for the authors to submit to the PDB, they thought that it would be the time and something right. So that's the history. For the rest of the talk, I'd just like to talk a little bit about these intrinsically unstructured proteins. Um, the, I think central dogma we all know up to making proteins. This has not changed. And then proteins, of course, fold up into a 3D structure, and then the 3D structure produces a function. This is the paradigm that we've all grown up, especially uh, the protein crystallographers. This last uh, link down here between a, between a um, structure and function is the area which I would like to raise as a possibility of being not quite the full story. And most of the credit belongs to uh, Keith Dunker, whom I've not met yet. I hope to meet him soon. In the early um, 1990s, he um, began to advocate that there were a class of proteins that were different from those that we're all used to. These are proteins that are intrinsically disordered. Uh, and uh, it, he argued that if um, protein, proteins contain, everyone knows certain regions, certain disordered regions. Often crystallographers are very unhappy there's a disordered region and try to sweep it under the rug. But very frequently you see large chunks of proteins that are disordered. And there are certain proteins you'll see in a second that have really no order whatsoever. And one of the questions is, is this disorderliness required for function. And a lot of Keith's work was based on experimental studies by uh, Peter Wright and, 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 and Dyson on uh, NMR studies of proteins in solution. And then this followed with a series of theoretical studies that are listed, including the most recent from Peter Tompa. Um, we were studying, as Amos said, for many years acetylcholinesterase, which is spinning around on the left side. It's a large single domain protein, almost 540 amino acids. In synapse, there are a number of other proteins which have um, the same fold, or thought to have the same fold. The sequence is very similar to acetylcholinesterase. These are proteins such as neurotactin, neuroligin, and gliotactin that are found in organisms from Drosophila up through man. These are proteins involved not in hydrolyzing acetylcholine as acetylcholinesterase, these are proteins involved in helping to actually form the nervous system in the early stages. And different from cholinesterase, these proteins have an extracytoplasmic region which has a sequence similarity to cholinesterase, a single pass transmembrane region, and a cytoplasmic region. So the extracytoplasmic portions are like cholinesterase. The cytoplasmic portions are not like anything that we could still find in, a, in any of the sequence databases. And in fact, the cytoplasmic portions of the three of these, these cholesterol-like adhesion molecules, these clams, don't show any similarity to each other. So this we thought would be an interesting class of proteins, especially because they lack one, two, or all three of the catalytic members of the triad, so they're, they're not en enzymes. So this is what I just said. One of the things that came out as we began studying these proteins was a fascinating paper by Germain et al. in France, on a study of twins in Scandinavia where they noticed that one of these clams, the neuroligin, which is known for its extracytoplasmic portion to bind to norexin, um, for certain members of these twins, a single point mutation or a nonsense mutation, others caused uh, autism spectrum disorder, different levels of autism. And uh, we looked at these sequence the variants and we're able to actually build a simple homology model to acetylcholinesterase. There's a large sugar nag on the surface, and right near the surface of the model is the mutation of an arginine going to a cysteine, sitting on the surface, almost implying, look, I'm interacting with something else, 
and possibly the interaction is not, not, not correct. So this really stimulated our interest in these proteins because there was possibly it might help at least the diagnostic purposes of understanding the basis of some causes of autism. Many children, of course, don't have this mutation. So what we think is that it's the interaction of the neural ligands with other proteins, and we're now looking in our lab at those interactions and trying to fish out if the other proteins may have the disorder. So what, one of the proteins we looked at before we knew about the neural ligand was this gliotactin, another one of the clams that shows the domain structure on the bottom. And we decided, since the outside portion has such high sim sequence similarity to cholinesterase, we'd look at the cytoplasmic portion, since nothing was known in the spirit of a structural genomics effort. So we, um, this is a graduate student at CZ, Ben Murakai, cloned, expressed, did everything, got huge amounts of the protein, both in coli and in baculovirus. This is a drosophila protein. The moldy MS showed it was the right protein, but everything else we did showed something was wrong with this protein. And I won't go into all the biophysics, I'll just show the NMR spectra. The top spectra of the 1D NMR shows a typically folded protein. The bottom spectrum is the protein, is the neotactin side cytoplasmic, the cytoplasmic portion, which is a protein which shows none of the rich chemical shifts of the spectrum above it. And this was work done with J Jacob Anglister and Tali Sharaf at the Weizmann, and they told us to forget the project. It will never crystallize. It's, it's well known to be an unfolded, or as he wrote, super unfolded protein. But um, Svia, who is a very good student, and Aviv has recently joined her to work with this project, carried on. And we looked at uh, some of the papers that had come out previously because we had thought we had discovered this, but in fact, uh, Keith Duncan had spoken about this many years before. One of the things he wrote in Nature Biotech paper was, this is kind of contrary to the normal question protein folders ask, rather than given the sequence, what is the fold? He said, since the amino acid sequence determined 3D structure, maybe amino acid sequence should also determine lack of 3D structure. And there's been a number of groups who have been focusing on this question. Given a sequence, can you just answer the question, will that protein by itself fold? Maybe uh, with partners it would be a different story, but this protein by itself without ligands, without prosthetic groups, doesn't fold. And one of the simplest, and I think uh, one of the most powerful methods was developed by uh, Uversky, Gillespie, and Fink, and published in Proteins in 2000. They did a very simple computer experiment based on experimental data. They collected about 150 natively unfolded or unstructured proteins based on NMR spectra, like I just showed you. They went to the PDB and collected a series of equivalent proteins of the same length, all who were not interacting with other proteins, didn't have prosthetic groups, and so on. And they looked at some physical chemical properties. They didn't do genetic algorithms or any heuristic methods. They just thought of, how does a protein fold? A protein, this is a globule, not a membrane protein, folds by having a core of hydrophobic residues and then some hydrophilic surface charged residues. So they decided to plot for each of the proteins of those two categories, the unfolded and folded, the mean hydrophobicity and the mean net charge. They just used the Kai Doolittle for the hydrophobicity and they didn't include histidine, just the four fully charged amino acids. And they made a simple plot, which is the average, average um, charge on the vertical axis and the hydrophobicity on the x-axis. And uh, they took the absolute value of the charge. They just asked, is it highly charged positive or highly charged negative? They didn't care which. They just said it's highly charged. And what you can see in this graph is all of the red, red balls are examples of proteins that were experimentally measured to have no structure in solution. The square blue boxes are equivalent proteins in size from the PDB, which were known to have a structure based on the experimentally deposited and measured structures. This is, I think, a rare instance in, in bioinformatics where you can so easily divide a set of points without having any learning, this is based on just the physical chemistry, between unfolded and folded. So we took that graph, we rotated it around almost 170 degrees, so we made a series of points above the dashed line being folded, and below that, we made a simple web tool based on the Uversky algorithm. Oh, first off, to show you where our clams fitted in, the gliotactin cytoplasmic that uh, 
Sviya tried to crystallize, never got crystals. This is in the middle of the red region. The extracytoplasmic portion, like cholinesterase, is in the blue folded. The other clams, which we now have checked experimentally and shown to be unfolded, also come out to be an unfolded region. The extracytoplasmic portion, including cholinesterase, is folded. The only exception is the neural ligand cytoplasmic one, which is just on the verge, so it's an honest, honest graph. So this is a fold index with the website, but you can just find it in Google by typing fold index. Everything in green is corresponding to the blue region, to the bottom right of the graph. These are regions in a window. We make an arbitrary size window that you can vary in the web, web browser. It moves along and calculates the fold index value for each point. It's a running index very much like ones for hydrophobicity, but this is fold index taking these two values. As to cholinesterase is shown on the left, it's very well folded. Caldesmon is a protein known to be unfolded. It was shown by Uversky. It's all unfolded, all red. The gliotactin, the region on the right side, is the intrinsically unfolded portion, and it's all red. The portion just before it in high green is the transmembrane region full of, full of, um, of um, hydrophobicity, hydrophobic residues. It's interesting that the portion just to the left of the transmembrane, which corresponds to the cholinesterase-like domain, that this very simple profile of hydrophobicity and charge looks so similar between the cholinesterase and the gliotactin with only 20% sequence identity. So it's another kind of measure of similarity. This, now, what came out was a careful analysis from Dunker's lab looking at known open reading frames from various genomes that have been uh, studied uh, until uh, 2001. 22 bacterial, 7 archaea, and 5 eukaryotes. Looking at those sequences using a different fold, fold index uh, a tool called Ponder that they developed, it's somewhat similar. And they moved and looked through to see how many of the proteins had 40 or more amino acids that were contiguous that were predicted to be unfolded. And depending on which bacterial you looked at, it was anywhere between 7 to 33% of the bacterial open reading frames were predicted to have that large unfolded region. When you go to the eukaryotes, depending on which eukaryotic species was looked at, which organism, anywhere between one-third to two-thirds of the proteins have at least 40 residues or more not folded. So it's really a major difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. One of the recent papers from Peter Tompa's lab pointed out that a number, a large number of hub proteins fall directly into this class of intrinsically unfolded. There's now a website that Keith Dunker maintains. It's called the Database of Protein Disorder, the DPD database. That's the uh, URL in the, in the website. That picture keeps changing, showing you different kinds of unfolded proteins. On, on the site, there's a list of well over 20 different predictors of intrinsically unfolded proteins, including one by uh, Bertrand Rost's group, which is one of the best ones now available from, from Bertrand's lab. Examples, this is just a list of some of the examples, if you just do Google or look in PubMed, of proteins which have intrinsically unfolded or natively unfolded in the titles, including one of them, P53. When you look at a P53 in fold index, the paper from Bell's lab talks about N-terminus and C-terminus being unfolded, and you can see very simply that these appear to be large red regions as predicted to be unfolded in the fold index. They measured it in solution. This is examples of uh, ribosomal proteins. When you just take them from the crystal structure with the ribosome and just eliminate seeing the ribosomal RNA, and just look at each individual protein as they would appear in the ribosome, most of these proteins could not be crystallized by themselves. And when you look at them, even here, these are really strange proteins. Look at L15. It has this long, meandering region. Look at L39E. All this region just completely open. L19 has an apohelical region, this long, long stretch that's extended, as if these proteins are just wrapping around the, positive, the, the, the negatively uh, uh, charged phosphodiester uh, backbone. This is also very similar to coat proteins of viruses. But they don't have structures by themselves, only in the presence of partners. These are some other proteins where the structures have been determined, and one can see large regions that are seen to be disordered by themselves when they interact with partners, they form a structure. So just to give some questions in closing, fine. In terms of some key questions, 
probably the single most important question about these intrinsically disordered proteins that are so prevalent in eukaryotes, are they really unfolded in vivo? And there's a large amount of data now, especially from Peter Tompla's laboratory, that indicates yes. Corollary to that is if they are, if they were intrinsically unfolded in vivo, why aren't they degraded? Even the protein that we were studying, the cytoplasmic portions of all of these clams, as a rule, are not degraded. It's as if something in the sequence prevents them from being degraded, even though they're extended in obvious candidates for proteases. Are intrinsic and disordered proteins more pro promiscuous? That is, do they fold differently depending on their partner? And if this were the case, then this would open up a whole new concept from gene to protein, and proteins maybe having different structures with different partners, so in some sense, immediately giving multiplex functions. Does folding occur when partner recognition occurs, such as when these proteins are involved in forming the nervous system in development to two proteins? Are they unfolded, and as they come together, fold, so the quaternary structure is actually producing the tertiary structure? What functions do IDPs serve not by normally normal folded proteins, and why are there so many examples in eukaryotes? Just to give some idea of some of the advantages of IDPs, they're more malleable in regulation and binding. They're able to bind several ligands. They have enormous intermolecular surfaces, so a large number of proteins could bind to them, almost like a flypaper, if you like. Um, the idea of coupling folding and binding is, is well studied. And they could be very useful for signal transduction, but they must bind specifically to initiate the process but they're able to dissociate very quickly. This has been shown in a number of experiments. Cellular advantages, there's more than 30 different functions attributed to these kinds of proteins. They are primarily, primarily associated with signal transduction and a number of other things, including DNA interactions. And they're ideal proteins involved in development of biology, because maybe, in fact, some of them are degraded. They would be made, used, and then degraded like messenger RNA in prokaryotes. This is a Final figure describing the fact that one shouldn't look at these proteins as monolithic. This is a, a, a figure pinched from a paper by Dyson and Wright. The left side shows classes of intrinsically unfolded proteins, two proteins that by themselves have no structure. When they come together and form a complex, they form a nice structure, while these two in solution have no structure. Other proteins um, have small portions which are unstructured, and then they can they can wrap up, such as a series of zinc finger proteins. And the final classes are proteins that are mostly folded with one region, unfolded, and again, when it finds a partner, this thing will fold up, and this portion sometimes folds and sometimes doesn't fold. I could go into many examples of function, but I don't want, we don't have time. This is just a food for thought from a crystallographer to show you that there's a class of proteins that don't follow the normal paradigm of uh, structure to function. They may follow the paradigm as we heard earlier, um, from uh, function to structure with the example of the book and the paperweight. So we're going to hold a meeting, mostly organized in this instance by Peter Tompa. It's an EMBO workshop in Budapest from May 20th to 24th. These are all of the people who have agreed to come to the meeting, and, it's, it, and um, it should be a really, really interesting meeting. We don't have a website, so but just mark the date, and very soon there'll be a website if you would like to come. Um, in closing, I think, if one wants to think about the future, this is a quotation taken from uh, Dino Moras of where we should be thinking about 2016. It was given at the uh, Spine 2 workshop that was held in uh, Montecatini last year. What we need to be able is to see biomolecules and complexes dancing in the cell. This is just one simple example of the ATP synthetase, as everyone's seen. So we've established a small group, a working group of Lucia Bonke, Wolfgang Baumeister, Udo Heinemann, Gunter Schneider, and myself, called the Forum for European Structural Proteomics, funded by the EC, whose goal is to assess European infrastructure and structural biology and recommend policies for the next five years of which directions to go. And this is the website for the FESP down at the bottom. So in 2016, this picture again of Amos, so you can see a molecule a bit like Amos on the right side, out of kinase. This is going through all the different crystal structures and morphing between them to show you just how much movement you can see in a structure. It really wonders about the idea from sequence to structure, which is the right structure. So one can think of kind of questions we could be asking in 2016. I think you could ask many other questions. 
and I'm sure Amos will be up beyond that for 2026 and beyond. So these are some of the people who worked on both the experimental portion and the fold index together with Israel Silman, who's worked many more years in Kovan Astrace than I, and we've collaborated on this for a long time. And the work was done in close collaboration with our Structural Proteomics Center of the Weizmann, and I've left some brochures outside of the center if people want to read about it. Thank you. Okay, so do we have questions for Joel, please? Uh, one here. Joel, I was wondering uh, what, what happens with the sequences, with the uh, unfolded sequences? Are they easy to align? Is there an evolutionary trace? Do, do they pose problems to, to, to sequence alignments? Um, if you look at uh, proteins that are homologs across different organisms, as a rule, the unfolded portions, let's say if there's a portion folded or not folded, both predicted and experiment, the unfolded ones appear to be much more varied. It looks like there's more ways to have unfolded proteins than folded. We've seen there are many ways to have folded proteins, but they appear to evolve faster. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, just a minute to thank the speaker one more time. Thank you, Joel.